Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today on the podcast, we have an absolutely seminal decision. This is one that I can guarantee uh, everyone's going to touch in some way at some point in law school and beyond. We have the Queen and Grant, which is a 2009 decision out of the Supreme Court. I learned about it in civil procedure, so I mostly know uh, about the arrest and detention functions of it and a little bit of the 24-2. Where did you learn it, Zach? I don't remember which class I learned it in, if I'm honest. It was (laughs) one of the criminal ones. Mm -hmm. Um, It most prominently was featured in Criminal on the Charter with uh, Justice Pomerantz in my third year. And since I've started my articling, I've been ensuring that I keep up with the more recent Anka cases. And in every criminal Anka case, you will see the 24-2 analysis. So I've become very familiar with it as it's like the three-step test to determine the admissibility of evidence that um, that contravenes the charter, basically. Yeah, no, I remember uh, from, I believe I did it in criminal procedure and evidence, I think, the 24-2 aspect, because obviously if we have a charter breach, that doesn't necessarily mean that the evidence is going to get tossed. We don't have, again, the lies law and order tells me, hashtag law and order lies. Uh, Just because something is from the fruit of the poisonous tree doesn't mean it gets tossed in Canada. We don't have that rule. So even if there has been a charter breach, we still have to examine it under 24-2 to see that if uh, to see if the evidence is going to be excluded or not. So that's our exclusion function. And I remember it replaced a previous decision in um, Collins. So now the test, I believe, is still grant for exclusion of evidence, you know, even 11 years later. Yes. Yeah, it is. It, like I said, it's it was cited in the most recent Anka case that I read. And I think that case came out on Thursday of this week, or the past week that we're recording this, which is in 2020, by the way, so no yes. one needs to freak out. I'm not going that far back. But um, I I like the grant analysis, and I like the balancing factor that it does, because unlike the American system here, when something contravenes the charter, we look at it on a scale. Mm-hmm. And effectively, that's what the 24-2 analysis is, is the higher mm-hmm. up on the spectrum of charter infringing conduct, the more likely something is to be it admissible. Mm -hmm. But if it's on the lower end, and it's most often justified in my experience and what I've read is what's known as like good faith on the part of the police, if the police tried to act in good faith, and it was an honest mistake, Mm -hmm. then it's more likely to be admitted, even though the charter was breached. If we lived in an absolute system, the evidence would be thrown out automatically. So we take a bit more of a nuanced approach than what my understanding of the American system is. Yes, that's also my understanding as well. I think um, often the courts, and I believe they do it in Grant as well, they're really focused on the truth-seeking function of a trial. So if uh, keeping the evidence would help the trier in order to establish what actually happened, you know, they're very likely to include it just because, you know, obviously that's not the official test. I'm just saying sort of the broad, far away approach is that the trial is a function to seek the truth. And so if anything's going to sort of go to the benefit of that, they're going to probably leave it in. And in terms of arrest and detention, I know the definition, the official test for detention is also from Grant, I believe. Yes, yeah, Grant Grant does still provide us like a okay. strong understanding of like what constitutes detention because there are effectively for our listeners if you haven't heard it, but there's two types. There is physical detention where you're physically detained by Mm -hmm. the police. And there's what's called psychological detention where you don't believe you can leave the um, the conversation. It's mostly a conversation. You can't leave the situation you're in because you don't believe you can leave. You believe the police are keeping you there. And you don't physically have to be restrained, though. Yeah, that was my understanding as well, is that psychological detention is when, like, you feel like you cannot go. Because there will be whatever consequences or what have you, but you're under the impression that you are not free to leave. And so you are detained. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As I must say a lot of my Section 9 knowledge just it comes from the mood I did last year because Section 9 was a basis. Uh, I did a class action mood and Section 9 was the basis for the action. It was a protest fake scenario. And uh, oh, cool. it was about, yeah, it was about detention with protesters, um, obviously modeled off the G20 
summit in Toronto. So yeah, that's the majority of mm-hmm. my Section 9 knowledge is from the moot, unfortunately. Not so much from glass, but there were other things in criminal procedure, I think, that stuck in my brain a little more than this one. And as I say, you're definitely the expert because you deal with this one all the time uh, at work currently. So uh, yeah, we're going to split this one up into parts because it's a whole lot, but we hope you enjoy. The Queen and Grant Heard April 24, 2008 and July 17, 2009 On appeal from the Court of Appeal for Ontario The judgment of Chief Justice McLaughlin and Justices LaBelle, Fish, Abella, and Charron was delivered by the Chief Justice and Justice Charron Part 1. Overview Mr. Grant appeals his convictions on a series of firearms offenses relating to a gun seized by police during an encounter on the Toronto sidewalk. The gun was entered as evidence against Mr. Grant and formed the basis of his convictions. The question on this appeal is whether that evidence was obtained in breach of Mr. Grant's charter rights, and if so, whether the evidence should have been excluded under Section 24.2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Resolving these questions requires us to revisit two important and contentious areas of criminal law charter jurisprudence. The first is the definition of detention under sections 9 and 10 of the Charter. The second is the test for exclusion of evidence obtained in violation of the Charter pursuant to section 24.2. The submissions before us reveal that existing jurisprudence on the issues of detention and exclusion of evidence is difficult to apply and may lead to unsatisfactory results. Without undermining the principles that animate the jurisprudence to date, we find it our duty, given the difficulties that have been pointed out to us, to take a fresh look at the frameworks that have been developed for the resolution of these two issues. We will also consider the subsidiary issue that arises in this case, the meaning of transfer of a weapon for the purpose of Section 88, 99, and 100 of the Criminal Code. Part 2. Facts The encounter at the center of this appeal occurred at midday on November 17, 2003 in the Greenwood and Danforth area of Toronto. With four schools in the area and a history of student assaults, robberies, and drug offenses occurring over the lunch hour, the three officers involved in the encounter were on patrol for the purposes of monitoring the area and maintaining a safe student environment. Two of the officers, Constables Worrell and Ford, were dressed in plain clothes and driving an unmarked car. Although on patrol, their primary task was to visit the various schools to determine if there were persons on school property who should not have been there, either non-students or students from another school. The third officer, Constable Gomez, was in full uniform and driving a marked police car. On directed patrol, he had been tasked with maintaining a visible police presence in the area in order to provide student reassurance and to deter crime during the high school lunch period. Mr. Grant, a young black man, was walking northbound on Greenwood Avenue when he came to the attention of Constables Worrell and Ford. As the two officers drove past, Constable Worrell testified that the appellant stared at them in an unusually intense manner and continued to do so as they proceeded down the street, while at the same time fidgeting with his coat and pants in a way that aroused their suspicions. Given their purpose for being in the area and based on what he had just seen, Constable Worrell decided that maybe we should have a chat with this guy and see what's up with him. Constable Worrell wanted to know whether Mr. Grant was a student at one of the schools they were assigned to monitor, and if he was not, whether he was headed to one of the schools anyway. Noticing Constable Gomez parked on the street ahead of Mr. Grant, and in light of his ununiformed attire, the two plainclothes officers suggested to Constable Gomez that he have a chat with the approaching appellant to determine if there was any need for concern. Constable Gomez then got out of his car and initiated an exchange with Mr. Grant while standing on the sidewalk directly in his intended path. The officer asked the appellant what's going on and requested his name and address. In response, the appellant provided a provincial health card. At one point, the appellant, behaving nervously, adjusted his jacket, prompting the officer to ask him to keep his hands in front of him. By this point, the two officers had returned and parked on the side of the street. 
Constable Worrell testified on cross-examination that he and Constable Ford pulled up because he got a funny feeling based on Mr. Grant's way of looking over at them, looking around all over the place, and adjusting himself. On direct examination, he said that, quote, he still seemed to be, I don't know, looking a bit nervous, the way he was looking around, looking at us, looking around when speaking to Officer Gomez. And at this time, I suggested to my partner, you know, I don't think it would hurt if we just go up to Officer Gomez and just stand by, just to make sure everything was okay, end quote. Thus, after a brief period observing the exchange from their car, the two officers approached the pair on the sidewalk, identified themselves to the appellant as police officers by flashing their badges, and took up positions behind Constable Gomez, obstructing the way forward. The exchange between Constable Gomez and Mr. Grant subsequent to the arrival of the two officers was as follows. Question, have you ever been arrested before? Answer, I got into some trouble about three years ago. Question, do you have anything on you that you shouldn't? Answer, no, well I got a small bag of weed. Question, where is it? Answer, it's in my pocket. Question, is that it? Answer, male puts head down. Yeah, well, no. Question, do you have other drugs on you? Answer, no, I just have weed, that's it. Question, well, what is it you have? Answer, I have a firearm. At this point, the officers seized and searched the appellant, seizing the marijuana and a loaded revolver. They then advised Mr. Grant of his rights to counsel and took him to the police station. Part 3. Judgments Below At trial, Mr. Grant alleged violations of his charter rights under sections 8, 9, and 10b of the charter. The trial judge held that the officer's inquiries did not amount to a search within the meaning of Section 8. He further concluded that Mr. Grant was not detained prior to his arrest, or, if he was detained, he waived his rights by cooperating with the officer's requests. Having found no charter breach, he had no difficulty admitting the firearm. Mr. Grant was convicted of five firearms offenses, including possession of a restricted firearm for the purpose of transferring it without lawful authority. In the Ontario Court of Appeal, Appeal Justice Laskin held that the trial judge's conclusion on the question of detention was undermined by several mischaracterizations as to what had occurred, thereby entitling the court to revisit the issue. He concluded that a detention had crystallized during the conversation with Constable Gomez before the appellant made his incriminating statements. Because the officers had no reasonable grounds to detain the appellant, the detention was arbitrary and a breach of Section 9 was established. Appeal Justice Laskin did not deal with Section 10b and found no breach of Section 8. On the question of exclusion under Section 24.2, Appeal Justice Laskin determined that the firearm was derivative evidence emanating from a self-incriminatory statement and would very often be excluded on that basis alone. However, after a review of recent developments in the Section 24.2 jurisprudence, Appeal Justice Laskin concluded that the admission of the gun would not unduly undermine trial fairness. He held that the repute of the administration of justice would be damaged more by the exclusion of the gun than by its admission. He therefore held the gun was properly admitted into evidence. On the firearms issue, Appeal Justice Laskin held that Mr. Grant's act of moving the gun from one place to another fell within the definition of transfer in Section 84 of the Code justifying the conviction under Section 101. He therefore dismissed the appeal. Part 4. Analysis. Subpart A. Breach of the Charter. The first issue in this case is whether the evidence of the gun was obtained in a manner that breached Mr. Grant's rights under the Charter. Mr. Grant argues that the police breached his Charter rights by arbitrarily detaining him, contrary to Section 9, and by failing to advise him of his right to speak to a lawyer contrary to Section 10b, before the questioning that led to the discovery of the firearm that is the subject of these charges. Alternatively, if the court finds he was not detained, Mr. Grant argues that the Court of Appeal erred in finding that there was no violation of Section 8's protection against unreasonable search and seizure. The threshold question is whether the appellant was detained before he produced the firearm and was arrested, if he was detained, the detention was arbitrary. All parties are agreed that police lacked legal grounds to detain the appellant. Further, if detained, Mr. Grant was entitled to be advised of the right to counsel at this point, 
which would establish breach of Section 10b of the Charter. The meaning of detention under the Charter. Positions of the Parties. Mr. Grant argues that he was detained before he made his inculpatory statements and revealed the gun. He contends that his liberty to choose to remain or leave was taken away by the conduct of police officers in blocking his path, and that this detention was arbitrary because at this point the officers lacked reasonable grounds to detain him under the standard for investigative detention elaborated in The Queen and Man. Because he was detained, he argues, the police were required to advise him under Section 10b that he had the right to speak to a lawyer. The Crown argues that Mr. Grant was not detained until the police arrested him after he disclosed his firearm, at which point they advised him of his right to talk to a lawyer. It says that the officer's prior conduct was not directed at curtailing the appellant's liberty, but rather at protecting their own safety while asking him some questions. The Crown says that the officers were engaging in community policing, which involves a dynamic interaction between the police and the citizens they serve. The Crown contends that preliminary non-coercive questioning pursuant to police policy is a legitimate exercise of investigative police powers, is essential to the effective fulfillment of the police's duty to enforce the law, and does not amount to detention triggering the right to counsel. Interpretive Principles As for any constitutional provision, the starting point must be the language of the section. Where questions of interpretation arise, a generous, purposive, and contextual approach should be applied. Constitutional guarantees such as Section 9 and Section 10 should be interpreted in a generous rather than legalistic way, aimed at fulfilling the purpose of the guarantee and securing for individuals the full benefit of the Charter's protection. Unduly narrow, technical approaches to Charter interpretation must be avoided, given their potential to subvert the goal of ensuring that right holders enjoy the full benefit and protection of the Charter. While the twin principles of purposive and generous interpretation are related and sometimes conflated, they are not the same. The purpose of a right must always be the dominant concern in its interpretation. Generosity of interpretation is subordinate to and constrained by that purpose. While a narrow approach risks impoverishing a charter right, an overly generous approach risks expanding its protection beyond its intended purposes. In brief, we must construe the language of Section 9 and 10 in a generous way that furthers without overshooting its purpose. To interpret detention in Section 9 and 10 generously, yet purposively, we must consider the context in which it is embedded, in other words, the role it plays in conjunction with related protections in the Charter. The purpose of the rights linked to detention. Detention represents a limit on the broad right to liberty enjoyed by everyone in Canada at common law, by virtue of Section 7 of the Charter, which guarantees that liberty will only be curtailed in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Section 9 of the Charter establishes that everyone has the right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. Section 10 accords certain rights to people who are arrested or detained, including the right to retain and instruct counsel. The purpose of Section 9, broadly put, is to protect individual liberty from unjustified state interference. As recognized by this Court in Blencoe and British Columbia, liberty, for Charter purposes, is not restricted to mere freedom from physical restraint, but encompasses a broader entitlement to make decisions of fundamental importance free from state interference. Thus, Section 9 guards not only against unjustified state intrusions upon physical liberty, but also against incursions on mental liberty by prohibiting the coercive pressures of detention and imprisonment from being applied to people without adequate justification. The detainee's interest in being able to make an informed choice whether to walk away or speak to the police is unaffected by the manner in which the detention is brought about. More specifically, an individual confronted by state authority ordinarily has the option to choose simply to walk away. Where this choice has been removed, whether by physical or psychological compulsion, the individual is detained. Section 9 guarantees that the state's ability to interfere with personal autonomy will not be exercised arbitrarily. Once detained, the individual's choice whether to speak to the authorities remains and is protected by the Section 10 informational requirements and the Section 7 right to silence. 
Detention also identifies the point at which rights subsidiary to detention, such as the right to counsel, are triggered. These rights are engaged by the vulnerable position of the person who has been taken into the effective control of the state authorities. They are principally concerned with addressing the imbalance of power between the state and the person under its control. More specifically, they are designed to ensure that the person whose liberty has been curtailed retains an informed and effective choice whether to speak to state authorities, consistent with the overarching principle, against self-incrimination. They also ensure that the person who is under the control of the state be afforded the opportunity to seek legal advice in order to assist in regaining his or her own liberty. As this court observed in the Queen and Ebert, quote, in a broad sense, the purpose of sections 7 to 14 is twofold, to preserve the rights of the detained individual and to maintain the repute and integrity of our justice system. More particularly, it is to the control of the superior power of the state vis-a-vis -vis the individual who has been detained by the state and thus placed in its power that Section 7 and the related provisions that follow are primarily directed. The state has the power to intrude on the individual's physical freedom by detaining him or her. The individual cannot walk away. The physical intrusion on the individual's mental liberty in turn may enable the state to infringe the individual's mental liberty by techniques made possible by its superior resources and power." End quote. By setting limits on the power of the state and imposing obligations with regard to the detained person through the concept of detention, the Charter seeks to effect a balance between the interests of the detained individual and those of the state. The power of the state to curtail an individual's liberty by way of detention cannot be exercised arbitrarily and attracts a reciprocal obligation to accord the individual legal protection against the state's superior power. Defining detention. The word detention admits of many meanings. Read narrowly, detention can be seen as indicating situations where the police take explicit control over the person and command obedience. Read expansively, detention can be read as extending to even a fleeting interference or delay. Neither of these extremes offers an acceptable definition of detention used in sections 9 and 10 of the Charter. The first extreme was rejected by this court in the Queen and Therens, which held that detention for Charter purposes occurs when a state agent, by way of physical or psychological restraint, takes away an individual's choice simply to walk away. This encompasses not only explicit interference with the subject's liberty by way of physical interference or express command, but any form of compulsory restraint. A person is detained when he or she submits or acquiesces in the deprivation of liberty and reasonably believes that the choice to do otherwise does not exist. It is clear that a person may reasonably believe he or she has no choice in circumstances where there has been no formal assertion of police control. Thus, the first interpretation must be rejected. This comports with the principle that a generous rather than legalistic approach must be applied to the interpretation of charter principles and avoids cramping the purpose of the protections conferred by sections 9 and 10 of the charter. The second interpretation of detention, reducing it to any interference, however slight, must also be rejected. As held in man, per Justice Iacobucci, Quote, the police cannot be said to detain within the meaning of sections 9 and 10 of the Charter every single suspect they stop for purposes of identification or even interview. The person who is stopped will in all cases be detained in the sense of delayed or kept waiting. But the constitutional rights recognized by sections 9 and 10 of the Charter are not engaged by delays that involve no significant physical or psychological restraint. End quote. It is clear that, while the forms of interference Section 9 guards against are broadly defined to include interferences with both physical and mental liberty, not every trivial or insignificant interference with this liberty attracts charter scrutiny. To interpret detention this broadly would trivialize the applicable charter rights and overshoot their purpose. Only the individual whose liberty is meaningfully constrained has genuine need of the additional rights accorded by the charter to people in that situation. Having rejected the extreme positions advanced, the question is whether between them the line that marks the detention under sections 9 and 10 is to be traced. This is a question that is not easily answered in the abstract, as in so many areas of the law, 
the most useful guidance derives from the decided cases. In what follows, we set out the general principle of choice that underlies the determination. We then discuss situations which illustrate where the line should be drawn. The general principle that determines detention for charter purposes was set out in Theron's. A person is detained where he or she, quote, submits or acquiesces in the deprivation of liberty and reasonably believes that the choice to do otherwise does not exist, end quote. This principle is consistent with the notion of choice that underlies our conception of liberty and as such shapes our interpretation of sections 9 and 10 of the Charter. When detention removes the choice to do otherwise but comply with the police direction, section 10b serves an indispensable purpose. It protects, among other interests, the detainee's ability to choose whether to cooperate with the investigation by giving a statement. The ambit of detention for constitutional purposes is informed by the need to safeguard this choice without impairing effective law enforcement. This explains why the extremes of formally assessed control on the one hand and a passing encounter on the other have been rejected. The former restricts detention in a way that denies the accused rights he or she needs and should have, while the latter would confer rights where they are neither necessary or appropriate. The language of sections 9 and 10 is consistent with this purpose-bound approach to detention. The pairing of detained and imprisoned in section 9 provides textual guidance for determining where the constitutional line between justifiable and unjustifiable interference should be drawn. Imprisonment connotes total or near total loss of liberty. The juxtaposition of imprisoned with detained suggests that detention requires significant deprivation of liberty. Similarly, the words arrest or detention in Section 10 suggest that a detention exists when the deprivation of liberty may have legal consequences. This linguistic context requires exclusion of police stops where the subject's rights are not seriously at issue. Moving on from the fundamental principle of the right to choose, we find that psychological constraint amounting to detention has been recognized in two situations. The first is where the subject is legally required to comply with the direction or demand as in the case of a roadside breath sample. The second is where there is no legal obligation to comply with the restrictive or coercive demand, but a reasonable person in the subject's position would feel so obliged. The rationale for this second form of psychological detention was explained by Justice Ledane in Theron's as follows. Quote, in my opinion, it is not realistic, as a general rule, to regard compliance with the demand or direction by a police officer as truly voluntary, in the sense that the citizen feels that he or she has the choice not to obey, even where there is in fact a lack of statutory or common law authority for the demand or direction, and therefore an absence of criminal liability for failure to comply with it. Most citizens are not aware of the precise legal limits of police authority. Rather than risk the application of physical force or prosecution for willful obstruction, the reasonable person is likely to err on the side of caution, assume lawful authority, and comply with the demand. The element of psychological compulsion in the form of a reasonable perception of suspension of freedom of choice is enough to make the restraint of liberty involuntary. Detention may be effected without the application or threat of application of physical restraint if the person concerned submits or acquiesces in the deprivation of liberty and reasonably believes that the choice to do otherwise does not exist, end quote. This second form of psychological detention, where no legal compulsion exists, has proven difficult to define consistently. The question is whether the police conduct would cause a reasonable person to conclude that he or she was not free to go and had to comply with the police direction or demand. As held in Theron's, this must be determined objectively, having regard to all the circumstances of the particular situation, including the conduct of the police. As discussed in more detail below, and summarized at paragraph 44, the focus must be on the state conduct in the context of the surrounding legal and factual situation, and how that conduct would be perceived by a reasonable person in the situation as it develops. The objective nature of this inquiry recognizes that the police must be able to know when a detention occurs in order to allow them to fulfill their attendant obligations under the Charter and afford the individual its added protections. However, 
the subjective intentions of the police are not determinative. While the test is objective, the individual's particular circumstances and perceptions at the time may be relevant in assessing the reasonableness of any perceived power imbalance between the individual and the police, and thus the reasonableness of any perception that he or she had no choice but to comply with the police directive. To answer the question whether there is a detention involves a realistic appraisal of the entire interaction as it developed, not as a minute parsing of words and movements. In those situations where the police may be uncertain whether their conduct is having a coercive effect on the individual, it is open to them to inform the subject in unambiguous terms that he or she is under no obligation to answer questions and is free to go. It is for the trial judge, applying the proper legal principles to the particular facts of the case, to determine whether the line has been crossed between police conduct that represents liberty and the individual's right to choose and conduct that does not. In most cases, it will be readily apparent whether or not an encounter between the police and an individual results in a detention. Making the task easier is the fact that what would reasonably be understood by all concerned is often informed by generally understood legal rights and duties, as a few examples illustrate. At one end of the spectrum of possibilities, detention overlaps with arrest or imprisonment and the charter will clearly apply. Similarly, a legal obligation to comply with a police demand or direction, such as a breath sample demand at the roadside, clearly denotes Section 9 detention. As Justice Ledane observed in Theron's, it is not realistic to speak of a person who is liable to arrest and prosecution for refusal to comply with the demand which a peace officer is empowered by statute to make as being free to refuse to comply. At the other end of the spectrum lie encounters between individual and police, where it would be clear to a reasonable person that the individual is not being deprived of a meaningful choice whether or not to cooperate with the police demand or directive and hence is not detained. We may rule out at the outset situations where police are acting in a non-adversarial role and assisting members of the public in circumstances commonly accepted as lacking the essential character of a detention. In many common situations, reasonable people understand that the police are not constraining individual choices, but rather helping people or gathering information. For instance, the reasonable person would understand that a police officer who attends at a medical emergency on a 911 call is not detaining the individuals he or she encounters. This is so even if the police, in taking control of the situation, effectively interfere with an individual's freedom of movement. Such deprivations of liberty will not be significant enough to attract charter scrutiny because they do not attract legal consequences for the concerned individuals. Another oft-discussed situation is when police officers approach bystanders in the wake of an accident or crime to determine if they witnessed the event and obtain information that may assist in their investigation. While many people may be happy to assist the police, the law is clear that subject to specific provisions that may exceptionally govern, the citizen is free to walk away. Given the existence of such a generally understood right in such circumstances, a reasonable person would not conclude that his or her right to choose whether to cooperate with them has been taken away. This conclusion holds true even if the person may feel compelled to cooperate with the police out of a sense of moral or civic duty. The Ontario Court of Appeal adverted to this concept in Graff, where Appeal Justice Crever wrote, quote, The law has long recognized that although there is no legal duty, there is a moral or social duty on the part of every citizen to answer questions put to him or her by the police and in that way assist the police. Implicit in that moral or social duty is the right of a police officer to ask questions, even in my opinion, when he or she has no belief that an offense has been committed. To be asked questions in these circumstances cannot be said to be a deprivation of liberty or security." End quote. In the context of investigating an accident or a crime, the police, unbeknownst to them at this point in time, may find themselves asking questions of a person who is implicated in the occurrence and consequently is at risk of self-incrimination. This does not preclude the police from continuing to question the person in pursuit of their investigation. Section 9 of the Charter does not require that police abstain from interacting with members of the public until they have specific grounds to connect the individual to the commission of a crime. 
nor does Section 10 require that the police advise everyone at the outset of any encounter that they have no obligation to speak to them and are entitled to legal counsel. Effective law enforcement is highly dependent on the cooperation of members of the public. The police must be able to act in a manner that fosters this cooperation, not discourage it. However, police investigative powers are not without limits. The notion of psychological detention recognizes the reality that police tactics, even in the absence of exercising actual physical restraint, may be coercive enough to effectively remove the individual's choice to walk away from the police. This creates the risk that the person may reasonably feel compelled to incriminate himself or herself. Where that is the case, the police are no longer entitled simply to expect cooperation from an individual. Unless, as stated earlier, the police inform the person that he or she is under no obligation to answer questions and is free to go, a detention may well crystallize and, when it does, the police must provide the subject with his or her Section 10b rights. That the obligation arises only on detention represents part of the balance between, on the one hand, the individual rights protected by Sections 9 and 10 and enjoyed by all members of society, and on the other, the collective interest of all members of society in the ability of the police to act on their behalf to investigate and prevent crime. A more complex situation may arise in the context of neighborhood policing, where the police are not responding to any specific occurrence, but where the non-coercive police role of assisting in meeting needs or maintaining basic order can subtly merge with the potentially coercive police role of investigating crime and arresting suspects so that they may be brought to justice. This is the situation that arises in this case. As discussed earlier, general inquiries by a patrolling officer present no threat to freedom of choice. On the other hand, such inquiries can escalate into situations where the focus shifts from general community-oriented concern to suspicion of a particular individual. Focused suspicion, in and of itself, does not turn the encounter into detention. What matters is how the police, based on that suspicion, interacted with the subject. The language of the Charter does not confine detention to situations where a person is in potential jeopardy of arrest. However, this is a factor that may help to determine whether, in a particular circumstance, a reasonable person would conclude he or she had no choice but to comply with a police officer's request. The police must be mindful that, depending on how they act and what they say, the point may be reached where a reasonable person in the position of that individual would conclude he or she is not free to choose to walk away or decline to answer questions. The length of the encounter said to give rise to the detention may be a relevant consideration. Consider the act of a police officer placing his or her hand on an individual's arm. If sustained, it might well lead a reasonable person to conclude that his or her freedom to choose whether to cooperate or not has been removed. On the other hand, a fleeting touch may not, depending on the circumstances, give rise to a reasonable conclusion that one's liberty has been curtailed. At the same time, it must be remembered that situations can move quickly and a single forceful act or word may be enough to cause a reasonable person to conclude that his or her right to choose how to respond has been removed. Whether the individual has been deprived of the right to choose to simply walk away will depend, to reiterate, on all of the circumstances in the case. It will be for the trial judge to determine on all the evidence. Deference is owed to the trial judge's findings of fact, although application of the law to the facts is a question of law. In summary, we conclude as follows. 1. Detention under Sections 9 and 10 of the Charter refers to a suspension of the individual's liberty interest by a significant physical or psychological restraint. Psychological detention is established either where the individual has a legal obligation to comply with the restrictive request or demand, or a reasonable person would conclude by reason of the state conduct that he or she had no choice but to comply. In cases where there is no physical restraint or legal obligation, it may not be clear whether a person has been detained. To determine whether the reasonable person in the individual circumstances would conclude that he or she had been deprived by the state of the liberty of choice 
the court may consider inter alia the following factors. A. The circumstances giving rise to the encounter as they would reasonably be perceived by the individual. Whether the police were providing general assistance, maintaining general order, making general inquiries regarding a particular occurrence, or singling out the individual for focused investigation. B. The nature of the police conduct, including the language used, the use of physical contact, the place where the interaction occurred, the presence of others, and the duration of the encounter. C. The particular characteristics or circumstances of the individual were relevant, including age, physical stature, minority status, level of sophistication. Part 2. Was the appellant detained prior to incriminating himself? Against this background, we return to the question at hand. Was Mr. Grant detained within the meaning of sections 9 and 10 of the Charter before the questions that led him to disclose his firearm? The trial judge held that he was not. An appellate court must approach a trial judge's decision on the issue with appropriate deference. However, we agree with Appeal Justice Laskin that the trial judge's conclusion on the question of detention is undermined by certain key findings of fact that cannot reasonably be supported by the evidence. In the circumstances, it is necessary to revisit the issue. This is not a clear case of physical restraint or compulsion by operation of law. Accordingly, we must consider all relevant circumstances to determine if a reasonable person in Mr. Grant's position would have concluded that his or her right to choose how to interact with the police, i.e. whether to leave or comply, had been removed. The encounter began with Constable Gomez approaching Mr. Grant, stepping in his path, and making general inquiries. Such preliminary questioning is a legitimate exercise of police powers. At this stage, a reasonable person would not have concluded he or she was being deprived of the right to choose how to act, and for that reason there was no detention. Constable Gomez then told the appellant to keep his hands in front of him. This act, viewed in isolation, might be insufficient to indicate detention on the ground that it was simply a precautionary directive. However, consideration of the entire context of what transpired from this point forward leads to the conclusion that Mr. Grant was detained. Two other officers approached, flashing their badges and taking tactical adversarial positions behind Constable Gomez. The encounter developed into one where Mr. Grant was singled out as the object of particularized suspicion, as evidenced by the conduct of the officers. The nature of the questioning changed from ascertaining the appellant's identity to determining whether he had anything that he should not. At this point, the encounter took on the character of an interrogation, going from general neighborhood policing to a situation where the police had effectively taken control over the appellant and were attempting to elicit incriminating information. Although Constable Gomez was respectful in his questioning, the encounter was inherently intimidating. The power imbalance was obviously exacerbated by Mr. Grant's youth and inexperience. Mr. Grant did not testify, so we don't know what his perceptions of the interaction actually were. However, because the test is an objective one, this is not fatal to his argument that there was a detention. We agree with Appeal Justice Laskin, concluding that Mr. Grant was detained. In our view, the evidence supports Mr. Grant's contention that a reasonable person in his position, 18 years old, alone, faced by three physically larger policemen in adversarial positions, would conclude that his or her right to choose how to act had been removed by the police, given their conduct. The police conduct that gave rise to an impression of control was not fleeting. The direction to Mr. Grant to keep his hands in front, in itself inconclusive, was followed by the appearance of two other officers flashing their badges and by questioning driven by focused suspicion of Mr. Grant. The sustained and restrictive tenor of the conduct after the direction to Mr. Grant to keep his hands in front of him reasonably supports the conclusion that the officers were putting him under their control and depriving him of his choice as to how to respond. We conclude that Mr. Grant was detained when Constable Gomez told him to keep his hands in front of him. The other two officers moved into position behind Constable Gomez, and Constable Gomez embarked on a pointed line of questioning. At this point, 
Mr. Grant's liberty was clearly constrained and he was in need of the charter protections associated with detention. Part 3. Was the detention arbitrary under Section 9? We have determined that the appellant was detained prior to his arrest. The question at this point is whether the detention was arbitrary within the meaning of Section 9. The Section 9 guarantee against arbitrary detention is a manifestation of the general principle enunciated in Section 7 that a person's liberty is not to be curtailed except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. As this court has stated, quote, this guarantee expresses one of the most fundamental norms of the rule of law. The state may not detain arbitrarily, but only in accordance with the law, end quote. Section 9 serves to protect individual liberty against unlawful state interference. A lawful detention is not arbitrary within the meaning of Section 9, unless the law authorizing the detention is itself arbitrary. Conversely, a detention not authorized by law is arbitrary and violates Section 9. Earlier suggestions that an unlawful detention was not necessarily arbitrary have been overtaken by man, in which this court confirmed the existence of a common law police power of investigative detention. The concern in the earlier cases was that an arrest made on grounds falling just short of the reasonable and probable grounds required for arrest should not automatically be considered arbitrary in the sense of being baseless or capricious. Mann, in confirming that a brief investigative detention based on reasonable suspicion was lawful, implicitly held that a detention in the absence of at least reasonable suspicion is unlawful and therefore arbitrary within Section 9. This approach mirrors the framework developed for assessing unreasonable searches and seizures under Section 8 of the Charter. Under the Queen and Collins and subsequent cases dealing with Section 8, a search must be authorized by law to be reasonable, the authorizing law must itself be reasonable, and the search must be carried out in a reasonable manner. Similarly, it should now be understood that for a detention to be non-arbitrary, it must be authorized by a law which is itself non-arbitrary. We add that, as with other rights, the Section 9 prohibition of arbitrary detention may be limited under Section 1 by such measures prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Here, the officers acknowledged at trial that they did not have legal grounds or reasonable suspicion to detain the accused prior to his incriminating statements. No issue was taken with this concession on appeal. We therefore conclude that the detention was arbitrary and in breach of Section 9. Part 4. Was the appellant's Section 10b right to counsel infringed? In the Queen and Subaru, we conclude that the Section 10b right to counsel arises immediately upon detention, whether or not the detention is solely for investigative purposes. That being the case, Section 10b of the Charter required the police to advise Mr. Grant that he had the right to speak to a lawyer and to give him a reasonable opportunity to obtain legal advice, if he so chooses, before proceeding to elicit incriminating information from him. Because he now faced significant legal jeopardy and had passed into the effective control of the police, the appellant was in immediate need of legal advice. Because the officers did not believe they had detained the appellant, they did not comply with their obligations under Section 10b. The breach of Section 10b is established. Part B, Exclusion of the Evidence. Part 1, Background. When must evidence obtained in violation of a person's charter rights be excluded? Section 24.2 of the Charter provides the following answer. Quote, where, in proceedings under subsection 1, a court concludes that evidence was obtained in a manner that infringed or denied any rights or freedoms guaranteed by this Charter, the evidence shall be excluded if it is established that having regard to all the circumstances, the admission of it in the proceedings would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. End quote. Section 24.2 
The test set out in Section 24.2 what would bring the administration of justice into disrepute having regard to all the circumstances is broad and imprecise. The question is what considerations enter into making this determination. In Collins and in the Queen and Stillman, this court endeavored to answer this question. The Collins-Stillman framework, as interpreted and applied in subsequent decisions, has brought a measure of certainty to the Section 24.2 inquiry. Yet the analytical method it imposes and the results it sometimes produces have been criticized as inconsistent with the language and objectives of Section 24.2. In order to understand these criticisms, it is necessary to briefly review the holdings in Collins and Stillman. In Collins, the court, per Justice Lemaire as he then was, proceeded by grouping the factors to be considered under Section 24.2 into three categories. One, whether the evidence will undermine the fairness of the trial by effectively conscripting the accused against himself or herself. Two, the seriousness of the charter breach. And three, the effect of excluding the evidence on the long-term repute of the administration of justice. While Justice Lemaire acknowledged that these categories were merely a matter of personal preference, they quickly became formalized as the governing test for Section 24.2. Collins shed important light on the factors relevant to determining admissibility of charter violative evidence under Section 24.2. However, the concepts of trial fairness and conscription under the first branch of Collins introduced new problems of their own. Moreover, questions arose about what work, if any, remained to be done under the second and third categories once conscription leading to trial and fairness had been found. Finally, issues arose as to how to measure the seriousness of the breach under the second branch and what weight, if any, should be put on the seriousness of the offense charged in deciding whether to admit the evidence. The admission of physical or real evidence obtained from the body of the accused in breach of his or her charter rights proved particularly problematic. Ten years after Collins, the court revisited this question in Stillman. The majority held that evidence obtained in breach of the charter should, at the outset of the Section 24.2 inquiry, be classified as either conscriptive or non-conscriptive. Evidence would be classified as conscriptive where an accused in violation of his charter rights is compelled to incriminate himself at the behest of the state by means of a statement, the use of the body, or the production of bodily samples. The category of conscriptive evidence was also held to include real evidence discovered as a result of an unlawful conscripted statement. This is known as derivative evidence. Stillman held that conscriptive evidence is generally inadmissible because of its presumed impact on trial fairness, unless if it would have been independently discovered. Despite reminders that all the circumstances must always be considered under Section 24.2, Stillman has generally been read as creating an all but automatic exclusionary rule for non discoverable conscriptive evidence broadening the category of conscriptive evidence and increasing its importance to the ultimate decision on admissibility. This general rule of inadmissibility of all non-discoverable conscriptive evidence, whether intended by Stillman or not, seems to go against the requirement of Section 24.2 that the court determining admissibility must consider all the circumstances. The underlying assumption that the use of conscriptive evidence always or almost always renders the trial unfair is also open to challenge. In other contexts, this court has recognized that a fair trial is one which satisfies the public interest in getting at the truth while preserving basic procedural fairness to the accused. It is difficult to reconcile trial fairness as a multifaceted and contextual concept with a near-automatic presumption that admission of a broad class of evidence will render a trial unfair, regardless of the circumstances in which it was obtained. In our view, trial fairness is better conceived as an overarching systemic goal than as a distinct stage of the Section 24.2 analysis. This brief review of the impact of Collins and Stillman brings us to the heart of our inquiry on this appeal, 
clarification of the criteria relevant to determining when, in all the circumstances, admission of evidence obtained by a charter breach would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Part 2. Overview of a revised approach to Section 24.2. The words of Section 24.2 capture its purpose, to maintain the good repute of the administration of justice. The term administration of justice is often used to indicate the processes by which those who break the law are investigated, charged, and tried. More broadly, however, the term embraces maintaining the rule of law and upholding charter rights in the justice system as a whole. The phrase, bring the administration of justice into disrepute, must be understood in the long-term sense of maintaining the integrity of and public confidence in the justice system. Exclusion of evidence resulting in an acquittal may provoke immediate criticism. But Section 24.2 does not focus on immediate reaction to the individual case. Rather, it looks to whether the overall repute of the justice system, viewed in the long term, will be adversely affected by admission of the evidence. The inquiry is objective. It asks whether a reasonable person, informed of all relevant circumstances and the values underlying the Charter, would conclude that the admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Section 24.2's focus is not only long-term, but prospective. The fact of the Charter breach means damage has already been done to the administration of justice. Section 24.2 starts from that proposition and seeks to ensure that evidence obtained through that breach does not do further damage to the repute of the justice system. Finally, Section 24.2's focus is societal. Section 24.2 is not aimed at punishing the police or providing compensation to the accused, but rather at systemic concerns. The Section 24.2 focus is on the broad impact of admission of the evidence on the long-term repute of the justice system. A review of the authorities suggests that whether the admission of evidence obtained in breach of the Charter would bring the administration of justice into disrepute engages three avenues of inquiry, each rooted in the public interest engaged by Section 24.2, viewed in a long-term, forward-looking, and societal perspective. When faced with an application for exclusion under Section 24.2, a court must assess and balance the effect of admitting the evidence on society's confidence in the justice system, having regard to 1. The seriousness of the charter infringing state conduct. Admission may send the message the justice system condones serious state misconduct. 2. The impact of the breach on the charter protected interests of the accused. Admission may send the message that individual rights count for little. And three, society's interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits. The court's role on a Section 24.2 application is to balance the assessments under each of these lines of inquiry to determine whether, considering all the circumstances, admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. These concerns, while not precisely tracking the categories of considerations set out in Collins, capture the factors relevant to the Section 24.2 determination as enunciated in Collins in subsequent jurisprudence. Subpart A. Seriousness of the Charter Infringing State Conduct The first line of inquiry relevant to the Section 24.2 analysis requires a court to assess whether the admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute by sending a message to the public that the courts, as institutions responsible for the administration of justice, effectively condone state deviation from the rule of law by failing to disassociate themselves from the fruits of the unlawful conduct. The more severe or deliberate the state conduct that led to the charter violation, the greater the need for courts to disassociate themselves from that conduct by excluding evidence linked to that conduct in order to preserve public confidence in and ensure state adherence to the rule of law. This inquiry, therefore, necessitates an evaluation of the seriousness of the state conduct that led to the breach. 
The concern of this inquiry is not to punish the police or to deter charter breaches, although deterrence of charter breaches may be a happy consequence. The main concern is to preserve public confidence in the rule of law and its processes. In order to determine the effective admission of the evidence on public confidence in the justice system, the court on a Section 242 application must consider the seriousness of the violation viewed in terms of the gravity of the offending conduct by state authorities whom the rule of law requires to uphold the rights guaranteed by the Charter. State conduct resulting in Charter violations varies in seriousness. At one end of the spectrum, admission of evidence obtained through inadvertent or minor violations of the Charter may minimally undermine public confidence in the rule of law. At the other end of the spectrum, admitting evidence obtained through a willful or reckless disregard of Charter rights will inevitably have a negative effect on the public confidence in the rule of law and risk bringing the administration of justice into disrepute. Extenuating circumstances, such as the need to prevent the disappearance of evidence, may attenuate the seriousness of police conduct that results in a charter breach. Good faith on the part of the police will also reduce the need for the court to disassociate itself from the police conduct. However, ignorance of charter standards must not be rewarded or encouraged and negligence or willful blindness cannot be equated with good faith. Willful or flagrant disregard of the Charter by those very persons who are charged with upholding the right in question may require that the court disassociate itself from such conduct. It follows that deliberate police conduct in violation of established Charter standards tends to support exclusion of the evidence. It should also be kept in mind that for every Charter breach that comes before the courts, many others go unidentified and unredressed because they did not turn up relevant evidence leading to a criminal charge. In recognition of the need for courts to distance themselves from this behavior, therefore, evidence that the charter infringing conduct was part of a pattern of abuse tends to support exclusion. Subpart B, Impact on the Charter Protected Interests of the Accused. This inquiry focuses on the seriousness of the impact of the charter breach on the charter-protected interests of the accused. It calls for an evaluation of the extent to which the breach actually undermined the interests protected by the right infringed. The impact of a charter breach may range from fleeting and technical to profoundly intrusive. The more serious the impact on the accused protected interests, the greater the risk that admission of the evidence may signal to the public that charter rights, however high-sounding, are of little actual avail to the citizen, breeding public cynicism and bringing the administration of justice into disrepute. To determine the seriousness of the infringement from this perspective, we look to the interests engaged by the infringed right and examine the degree to which the violation impacted on those interests. For example, the interests engaged in the case of a statement to the authorities obtained in a breach of the Charter include the Section 7 right to silence or to choose whether or not to speak to authorities, all stemming from the principle against self-incrimination. The more serious the incursion on these interests, the greater the risk that admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Similarly, an unreasonable search, contrary to Section 8 of the Charter, may impact on the protected interests of privacy and, more broadly, human dignity. An unreasonable search that intrudes on an area in which the individual reasonably enjoys a high expectation of privacy, or that demeans his or her dignity, is more serious than one that does not. Subpart C society's interest in an adjudication on the merits. Society generally expects that a criminal allegation will be adjudicated on its merits. Accordingly, the third line of inquiry relevant to the Section 242 analysis asks whether the truth-seeking function of the criminal trial process would be better served by admission of the evidence or by its exclusion.
This inquiry reflects society's collective interest in ensuring that those who transgress the law are brought to trial and dealt with according to the law. Thus, the court suggested in Collins that a judge on a Section 242 application should consider not only the negative impact of admission of the evidence on the repute of the administration of justice, but the impact of failing to admit the evidence. The concern for truth-seeking is only one of the considerations under a Section 242 application. The view that reliable evidence is admissible regardless of how it was obtained is inconsistent with the Charter's affirmation of rights. More specifically, it is inconsistent with the wording of Section 242, which mandates a broad inquiry into all the circumstances, not just the reliability of the evidence. This said, public interest in truth-finding remains a relevant consideration under the Section 242 analysis. The reliability of evidence is an important factor in this line of inquiry. If a breach, such as one that effectively compels the subject to talk, undermines the reliability of the evidence, this points in the direction of exclusion of the evidence. The admission of unreliable evidence serves neither the accused interest in a fair trial nor the public interest in uncovering the truth. Conversely, Exclusion of relevant and reliable evidence may undermine the truth-seeking function of the justice system and render the trial unfair from the public perspective, thus bringing the administration of justice into disrepute. The fact that the evidence obtained in breach of the Charter may facilitate the discovery of truth in the adjudication of a case on its merits must therefore be weighed against factors pointing to exclusion in order to balance the interests of truth with the integrity of the justice system. The court must ask whether the vindication of the specific charter violation through the exclusion of evidence exacts too great a toll on the truth-seeking goal of the criminal trial. The importance of the evidence to the prosecution's case is another factor that may be considered in this line of inquiry. Like Justice Deschamps, we view this factor as corollary to the inquiry into reliability in the following limited sense. The admission of evidence of questionable reliability is more likely to bring the administration of justice into disrepute where it forms the entirety of the case against the accused. Conversely, the exclusion of highly reliable evidence may impact more negatively on the repute of the administration of justice where the remedy effectively guts the prosecution. It has also been suggested that the judge should also, under this line of inquiry, consider the seriousness of the offense at issue. Indeed, Justice Deschamps views this factor as very important, arguing that the more serious the offense, the greater society's interest in its prosecution. In our view, while the seriousness of the alleged offense may be a valid consideration, it has the potential to cut both ways. Failure to effectively prosecute a serious charge due to excluded evidence may have an immediate impact on how people view the justice system. Yet, as discussed, it is the long-term repute of the justice system that is Section 242's focus. As pointed out in Burlingham, the goals furthered by Section 242 operate independently of the type of crime for which the individual stands accused. And, as Justice Lamel observed in Collins, quote, the Charter is designed to protect the accused from the majority, so the enforcement of the Charter must not be left to the majority, end quote. The short-term public clamor for a conviction in a particular case must not deafen the Section 242 judge to the longer-term repute of the administration of justice. Moreover, while the public has a heightened interest in seeing a determination on the merits where the offense charge is serious, it also has a vital interest in having a justice system that is above reproach, particularly where the penal stakes for the accused are high. To review, the three lines of inquiry identified above, the seriousness of the charter infringing state conduct, the impact of the breach on the charter protected interests of the accused, and the societal interest in an adjudication on the merits 
reflect what the Section 24.2 judge must consider in assessing the effect of admission of the evidence on the repute of the administration of justice. Having made these inquiries which encapsulate consideration of all of the circumstances of the case, the judge must then determine whether, on balance, the admission of the evidence obtained by the charter breach would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. In all cases, it is the task of the trial judge to weigh the various indications. No overarching rule governs how the balance is to be struck. Mathematical precision is obviously not possible. However, the preceding analysis creates a decision tree, albeit more flexible than the Stillman self-incrimination test. We believe this to be required by the words of Section 24.2. We also take comfort in the fact that patterns emerge with respect to particular types of evidence. These patterns serve as guides to judges faced with Section 24.2 applications in future cases. In this way, a measure of certainty is achieved. Where the trial judge has considered the proper factors, appellate courts should accord considerable deference to his or her ultimate determination. Part 3. Application to Different Kinds of Evidence We have seen that a trial judge on a Section 24.2 application for exclusion of evidence obtained in a breach of the Charter must consider whether admission would bring the administration of justice into disrepute, having regard to the results of the three lines of inquiry identified above. We now turn to some of the types of evidence the cases have considered. Subpart A, Statements by the Accused. Statements by the accused engage the principle against self-incrimination, one of the cornerstones of our criminal law. This court in White at paragraph 44, per Justice Iacobucci, described the principle against self-incrimination as an overarching principle within our criminal justice system from which a number of specific common law and charter rules emanate, such as the Confessions Rule and the right to silence. The principle also informs more specific procedural protections, such as, for example, the right to counsel in Section 10b, the right to non-compelability in Section 11c, and the right to use immunity set out in Section 13. Residual protection for the principle against self-incrimination is derived from Section 7. This case concerns Section 24.2. However, it is important to note at the outset that the common law confessions rule, quite apart from Section 24.2, provides a significant safeguard against the improper use of a statement against its maker. Where a statement is made to a recognized person in authority, regardless of whether its maker is detained at the time, it is inadmissible unless the Crown can establish beyond a reasonable doubt that it was made voluntarily. Only if such a statement survives scrutiny under the Confessions Rule and is found to be voluntary does the Section 24.2 remedy of exclusion arise. Most commonly, this will occur because of added protections under Section 10b of the Charter. There is no absolute rule of exclusion of Charter infringing statements under Section 24.2, as there is for involuntary confessions at common law. However, as a matter of practice, courts have tended to exclude statements obtained in breach of the Charter, on the ground that admission on balance would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. The three lines of inquiry described above support the presumptive general, although not automatic, exclusion of statements obtained in breach of the Charter. The first inquiry focuses on whether admission of the evidence would harm the repute of justice by associating the courts with illegal police conduct. Police conduct in obtaining statements has long been strongly constrained. The preservation of public confidence in the justice system requires that the police adhere to the Charter in obtaining statements from a detained accused. The negative impact on the justice system of admitting evidence obtained through police misconduct varies with the seriousness of the violation. The impression that courts condone serious police misconduct is more harmful to the repute of the justice system than the acceptance of minor or inadvertent slips.
The second inquiry considers the extent to which the breach actually undermined the interests protected by the right infringed. Again, the potential to harm the repute of the justice system varies with the seriousness of the impingement on the individual's protected interests. As noted, the right violated by unlawfully obtained statements is often the right to counsel under Section 10b. The failure to advise of the right to counsel undermines the detainee's right to make a meaningful and informed choice whether to speak. The related right to silence, and most fundamentally, the protection against testimonial self-incrimination. These rights protect the individual's interest in liberty and autonomy. Violation of these fundamental rights tends to militate in favor of excluding the statement. This said, particular circumstances may attenuate the impact of a charter breach on the protected interests of the accused from whom a statement is obtained in breach of the charter. For instance, if an individual is clearly informed of his or her choice to speak to the police, but compliance with Section 10b was technically defective at either the informational or implementational stage, the impact on the liberty and autonomy interests of the accused in making an informed choice may be reduced. Likewise, when a statement is made spontaneously following a charter breach, or in the exceptional circumstances where it can confidently be said that the statement in question would have been made notwithstanding the charter breach, the impact of the breach on the accused's protected interest in informed choice may be less. Absent such circumstances, the analysis under this line of inquiry supports the general exclusion of statements taken in breach of the Charter. The third inquiry focuses on the public interest in having the case tried fairly on its merits. This may lead to consideration of the reliability of the evidence. Just as involuntary confessions are suspect on grounds of reliability, so may on occasion be statements taken in contravention of the Charter. Detained by the police and without a lawyer, a suspect may make statements that are based more on a misconceived idea of how to get out of his or her predicament than on the truth. This danger, where present, undercuts the argument that the illegally obtained statement is necessary for a trial on the merits. In summary, the heightened concern with proper police conduct in obtaining statements from suspects and the centrality of the protected interests affected will in most cases favor exclusion of statements taken in breach of the Charter, while the third factor, obtaining a decision on the merits, may be attenuated by lack of reliability. This, together with the common law's historic tendency to treat statements of the accused differently from other evidence, explains why such statements tend to be excluded under Section 24.2. Subpart B, Bodily Evidence. Bodily evidence is evidence taken from the body of the accused, such as DNA evidence and breath samples. Section 8 of the Charter protects against unreasonable search and seizure, and hence precludes the state from obtaining such evidence in a manner that is unreasonable. The majority in Stillman, applying a capacious definition of conscription, held that bodily evidence is conscriptive and that its admission would affect trial fairness. This resulted in a near-automatic exclusionary rule for bodily evidence obtained contrary to the Charter. Stillman has been criticized for casting the flexible in all circumstances test prescribed by Section 24.2 into a straight jacket that determines admissibility solely on the basis of the evidence's conscriptive character rather than all the circumstances. For inappropriately erasing distinctions between testimonial and real evidence, and for producing anomalous results in some situations. We will briefly review each of these criticisms. The first criticism is that the Stillman approach transforms the flexible all the circumstances test mandated by Section 24.2 into a categorical conscriptive evidence test. Section 24.2 mandates a broad contextual approach rather than an automatic exclusionary rule. As stated in Orbanski, per Justice LaBelle, the inquiry under Section 24.2 amounts to finding a proper balance between competing interests and values at stake in the criminal trial, between the search for truth and the integrity of the trial. 
all the Collins factors remain relevant throughout this delicate and nuanced inquiry. A flexible, multi-factored approach to the admissibility of the evidence is required, not only by the wording of Section 24.2, but by the wide variation between different kinds of bodily evidence. The seriousness of the police's conduct and the impact on the accused's rights of taking the bodily evidence may vary greatly. Plucking a hair from the suspect's head may not be intrusive, and the accused's privacy interests in the evidence may be relatively slight. On the other hand, a body cavity or strip search may be intrusive, demeaning, and objectionable. A one-size-fits-all conscription test is incapable of dealing with such differences in a way that addresses the point of the Section 24.2 inquiry, to determine if the admission of the evidence will bring the administration of justice into disrepute. Recent decisions suggest a growing consensus that the admissibility of bodily samples should not depend solely on whether the evidence is conscriptive. This court in the Queen and SAB, dealing with the constitutionality of DNA warrant provisions in the Criminal Code, acknowledged that the charter concerns raised by the gathering of non-testimonial evidence are better addressed by reference to the interests of privacy, bodily integrity, and human dignity than by a blanket rule that by analogy to compelled statements, such evidence is always inadmissible. The second and related objection to a simple conscription test for the admissibility of bodily evidence under Section 24.2 is that it wrongly equates bodily evidence with statements taken from the accused. In most situations, statements and bodily samples raise very different considerations from the point of view of the administration of justice. Equating them under the umbrella of conscription risks erasing relevant distinctions and compromising the ultimate analysis of systemic disrepute. As Professor Pacioco has observed, in equating intimate bodily substances with testimony, we are not so much reacting to the compelled participation of the accused as we are to the violation of the privacy and dignity of the persons that obtaining such evidence involves. Nor does the taking of a bodily sample trench on the accused's autonomy in the same way as may the unlawful taking of a statement. The pretrial right to silence under Section 7, the right against testimonial self-incrimination in Section 11c, and the right against subsequent use of self-incriminating evidence in Section 13, have informed the treatment of statements under Section 24.2. These concepts do not apply coherently to bodily samples, which are not communicative in nature, weakening self-incrimination as the sole criterion for determining their admissibility. A third criticism of the conscription test for admissibility of bodily evidence under Section 24.2 is that from a practical perspective, the conscriptive test has sometimes produced anomalous results leading to exclusion of evidence that should, in principle and policy, be admitted. Notably, breath sample evidence tendered on impaired driving charges has often suffered the fate of automatic exclusion, even where the breach in question was minor and would not realistically bring the administration of justice into disrepute. More serious breaches in other kinds of cases, for instance those involving seizures of illegal drugs in breach of Section 8, have resulted in admission on the grounds that the evidence in question was non-conscriptive. This apparent incongruity has justifiably raised concern. We conclude that the approach to admissibility of bodily evidence under Section 24.2 that asks simply whether the evidence was conscripted should be replaced by a flexible test based on all the circumstances as the wording of Section 24.2 requires. As for other types of evidence, admissibility should be determined by inquiring into the effect admission may have on the repute of the justice system, having regard to the seriousness of the police conduct, the impact of the charter breach on the protected interests of the accused, and the value of a trial on the merits. The first inquiry informing the Section 24.2 analysis, the seriousness of the charter infringing conduct, is fact-specific. Admission of evidence obtained by deliberate and egregious police conduct that disregards the rights of the accused may lead the public to conclude that the court implicitly condones such conduct, 
undermining respect for the administration of justice. On the other hand, where the breach was committed in good faith, admission of the evidence may have little adverse effect on the repute of the court process. The second inquiry assesses the danger that admitting the evidence may suggest that charter rights do not count, thereby negatively impacting on the repute of the justice system. This requires the judge to look at the seriousness of the breach of the accused protected interests. In the context of bodily evidence obtained in violation of Section 8, this inquiry requires the court to examine the degree to which the search and seizure intruded upon the privacy, bodily integrity, and human dignity of the accused. The seriousness of the intrusion on the accused may vary greatly. At one end of the spectrum, one finds the forcible taking of blood samples or dental impressions as in Stillman. At the other end of the spectrum lie relatively innocuous procedures such as fingerprinting or iris recognition technology. The greater the intrusion on these interests, the more important it is that a court exclude the evidence in order to substantiate the charter rights of the accused. The third line of inquiry the effect of admitting the evidence on the public interest in having a case adjudicated on its merits will usually favor admission in cases involving bodily samples. Unlike compelled statements, evidence obtained from the accused body is generally reliable, and the risk of error inherent in depriving the trier of fact of the evidence may well tip the balance in favor of admission. While each case must be considered on its own facts, it may be ventured in general that where an intrusion on bodily integrity is deliberately inflicted and the impact on the accused's privacy, bodily integrity, and dignity is high, bodily evidence will be excluded, notwithstanding its relevance and reliability. On the other hand, where the violation is less egregious and the intrusion is less severe in terms of privacy, bodily integrity, and dignity, reliable evidence obtained from the accused body may be admitted. For example, this will often be the case with breast sample evidence whose method of collection is relatively non-intrusive. Subpart C, non-bodily physical evidence. The three inquiries under Section 24.2 will proceed largely as explained above. Again, under the first inquiry, the seriousness of the charter infringing conduct will be a fact-specific determination. The degree to which this inquiry militates in favor of excluding the bodily evidence will depend on the extent to which the conduct can be characterized as deliberate or egregious. With respect to the second inquiry, the charter breach most often associated with non-bodily physical evidence is the Section 8 protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Privacy is the principal interest involved in such cases. The jurisprudence offers guidance in evaluating the extent to which the accused's reasonable expectation of privacy was infringed. For example, a dwelling house attracts a higher expectation of privacy than a place of business or an automobile. An illegal search of a house will therefore be seen as more serious at this stage of the analysis. Other interests, such as human dignity, may also be affected by search and seizure of such evidence. The question is how seriously the charter breach impacted on these interests. For instance, an unjustified strip search or body cavity search is demeaning to the suspect's human dignity and will be viewed as extremely serious on that account. The fact that the evidence thereby obtained is not itself a bodily sample cannot be seen to diminish the seriousness of the intrusion. The third inquiry whether the admission of evidence would serve society's interests in having a case adjudicated on its merits, like the others, engages the facts of the particular case. Reliability issues with physical evidence will not generally be related to the charter breach. Therefore, this consideration tends to weigh in favor of admission. Subpart D, Derivative Evidence. The class of evidence that presents the greatest difficulty is evidence that combines aspects of both statements and physical evidence. Physical evidence discovered as a result of an unlawfully obtained statement. The cases refer to this evidence as derivative evidence. This is the type of evidence at issue in this case. We earlier saw that at common law, involuntary confessions are inadmissible. 
The common law's automatic exclusion of involuntary statements is based on a sense that it is unfair to conscript a person against himself or herself, and, most importantly, on a concern about the unreliability of compelled statements. However, the common law drew the line of automatic inadmissibility at statements themselves and not the physical or real evidence found as a result of information garnered from such statements. Because reliability was traditionally the dominant focus of the confessions rule, the public interest in getting at the truth through reliable evidence was seen to outweigh concerns related to self-incrimination. Section 24.2 of the Charter implicitly overruled the common law practice of always admitting reliable derivative evidence. Instead, the Charter is required to consider whether admission of derivative evidence obtained through a Charter breach would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. The Section 24.2 jurisprudence on derivative physical evidence has thus far been dominated by two related concepts, conscription and discoverability. Physical evidence that would not have been discovered but for an inadmissible statement has been considered conscriptive and hence is inadmissible. The doctrine of discoverability has been developed in order to distinguish those cases in which the accused conscription was necessary to the collection of the evidence from those cases where the evidence would have been obtained in any event. In the former cases, exclusion was the rule, while the latter, admission was more likely. The conscription discoverability doctrine has been justifiably criticized as overly speculative and capable of producing anomalous results. In practice, it has proved difficult to apply because of its hypothetical nature and because of the fine-grained distinctions between the tests for determining whether evidence is derivative and whether it is discoverable. The existing rules on derivative evidence and discoverability were developed under the Collins Trial Fairness Rationale. They gave effect to the insight that if evidence would have been discovered in any event, the accused conscription did not truly cause the evidence to become available. The discoverability doctrine acquired even greater importance under Stillman, where the category of conscriptive evidence was considerably enlarged. Since we have concluded that this underlying rationale should no longer hold, and that trial fairness in the Collins-Stillman sense is no longer a determinative criterion for the Section 242 inquiry, discoverability should likewise not be determinative of admissibility. Discoverability retains a useful role, however, in assessing the actual impact of the breach on the protected interests of the accused. It allows the court to assess the strength of the causal connection between the charter infringing self-incrimination and the resultant evidence. The more likely it is that the evidence would have been obtained even without the statement, the lesser the impact of the breach on the accused's underlying interest against self-incrimination. The converse, of course, is also true. On the other hand, in cases where it cannot be determined with any confidence whether evidence would have been discovered in absence of the statement, discoverability will have no impact on the Section 242 inquiry. To determine whether the admission of derivative evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute under Section 242, courts must pursue the usual three lines of inquiry outlined in these reasons taking into account the self-incriminatory origin of the evidence and an improperly obtained statement as well as its status as real evidence. The first inquiry concerns the police conduct in obtaining the statement that led to the real evidence. Once again, the extent to which this inquiry favors exclusion will depend on the factual circumstances of the breach. The more serious the state conduct, the more the admission of the evidence derived from it tends to undermine public confidence in the rule of law. Were the police deliberately and systematically flouting the accused charter rights? Or were the officers acting in good faith, pursuant to what they thought were legitimate policing policies? The second inquiry focuses on the impact of the breach on the charter-protected interests of the accused. Where a statement is unconstitutionally obtained, in many cases, the charter right breached is the Section 10b right to counsel, which protects the accused's interest in making an informed choice whether or not to speak to authorities. The relevant consideration at this stage will be the extent to which the charter breach impinged upon that interest in a free and informed choice. 
where that interest was significantly compromised by the breach, this factor will strongly favor exclusion. In determining the impact of the breach, the discoverability of the derivative evidence may also be important as a factor strengthening or attenuating the self-incriminatory character of the evidence. If the derivative evidence was independently discoverable, the impact of the breach on the accused is lessened and admission is more likely. The third inquiry in determining whether admission of the derivative evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute relates to society's interest in having the case adjudicated on its merits. Since evidence in this category is real or physical, there is usually less concern as to the reliability of the evidence. Thus, the public interest in having a trial adjudicated on its merits will usually favor admission of the derivative evidence. The weighing process and balancing of these concerns is one for the trial judge in each case. Provided the judge has considered the correct factors, considerable deference should be accorded to his or her decision. As a general rule, however, it can be ventured that where reliable evidence is discovered as a result of a good faith infringement that did not greatly undermine the accused's protected interests, the trial judge may conclude that it should be admitted under Section 24.2. On the other hand, deliberate and egregious police conduct that severely impacted the accused's protected interests may result in exclusion notwithstanding that the evidence may be reliable. The Section 24.2 judge must remain sensitive to the concern that a more flexible rule may encourage police to improperly obtain statements that they know will be inadmissible in order to find derivative evidence which they believe may be admissible. The judge should refuse to admit evidence where there is reason to believe the police deliberately abused their power to obtain a statement which might lead them to such evidence. Where derivative evidence is obtained by way of a deliberate or flagrant charter breach, its admission would bring the administration of justice into further disrepute, and the evidence should be excluded. Part 4. Application to this case. The issue is whether the gun produced by Mr. Grant after Toronto police stopped and questioned him should be excluded from the evidence at his trial. The trial judge held that had a charter breach been established, he would not have excluded the evidence. While the trial judge's Section 24.2 conclusion may not command deference where an appellate court reaches a different conclusion on the breach itself, the trial judge's underlying factual findings must be respected, absent palpable and overriding error. Here, the admissibility of Mr. Grant's incriminatory statements is not an issue, the statements having no independent evidentiary value. The only issue is the admission or exclusion of a gun. This falls to be determined in accordance with the inquiries described earlier. At the outset, it is necessary to consider whether the gun was obtained in a manner that violated Mr. Grant's charter rights. As explained above, we have concluded that Mr. Grant's rights under Sections 9 and 10b of the Charter were breached. The discovery of the gun was both temporally and causally connected to these infringements. It follows that the gun was obtained as a result of a charter breach. Because the gun was discovered as a result of statements taken in breach of the Charter, it is derivative evidence. The question, as always, is whether its admission would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. To answer this question, it is necessary to consider the concerns that underlie the Section 24.2 analysis, as discussed above, in all the circumstances of the case, including the arbitrary detention and the breach of the right to counsel. We consider first the seriousness of the improper police conduct that led to the discovery of the gun. The police conduct here, while not in conformity with the Charter, was not abusive. There was no suggestion that Mr. Grant was the target of racial profiling or other discriminatory police practices. The officers went too far in detaining the accused and asking him questions. However, the point at which an encounter becomes a detention is not always clear and is something with which courts have struggled. Though we have concluded that the police were in error in detaining the appellant when they did, the mistake is an understandable one. Having been under a mistaken view that they had not detained the appellant, the officer's failure to advise him of his right to counsel was similarly erroneous but understandable. It therefore cannot be characterized as having been in bad faith. Given that the police conduct in committing the charter breach was neither deliberate nor egregious, 
we conclude that the effect of admitting the evidence would not greatly undermine public confidence in the rule of law. We add that the court's decision in this case will be to render similar conduct less justifiable going forward. While police are not expected to engage in judicial reflection on conflicting precedents, they are rightly expected to know what the law is. The second inquiry under the Section 24.2 analysis focuses on whether the admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute from the perspective of society's interest and respect for charter rights. This inquiry focuses on the impact of the breach on the accused protected interests. Because the two infringed charter rights protect different interests, it is necessary to consider them separately at this stage. The initial charter violation was arbitrary detention under Section 9 of the Charter, curtailing Mr. Grant's liberty interest. This interaction, beginning as a casual conversation, quickly developed into a subtly coercive situation that deprived Mr. Grant of his freedom to make an informed choice as to how to respond. This is so notwithstanding the fact that the detention did not involve any physical coercion and was not carried out in an abusive manner. We therefore conclude that the impact of this breach, while not severe, was more than minimal. The second charter violation was a breach of Mr. Grant's Section 10b right to counsel. Constable Gomez, by his own admission, was probing for answers that would give him grounds for search or arrest. Far from being spontaneous utterances, the appellant's incriminating statements were prompted directly by Constable Gomez's pointed questioning. The appellant, in need of legal advice, was not told he could consult counsel. As discussed, discoverability remains a factor in assessing the impact of charter breaches on charter rights. The investigating officers testified that they would not have searched or arrested Mr. Grant but for his self-incriminatory statements, nor would they have had any legal ground to do so. Accordingly, the fact that the evidence was non-discoverable aggravates the impact of the breach on Mr. Grant's interest in being able to make an informed choice to talk to the police. He was in immediate need of legal advice and had no opportunity to seek it. Considering all these matters, we conclude that the impact of the infringement of Mr. Grant's rights under Sections 9 and 10b of the Charter was significant. The third and final concern is the effect of admitting the gun on the public interest in having a case adjudicated on its merits. The gun is highly reliable evidence. It is essential to a determination on the merits. The Crown also argues that the seriousness of the offense weighs in favor of admitting the evidence of the gun so that the matter may be decided on its merits, asserting that gun crime is a societal scourge, that offenses of this nature raise major public safety concerns and that the gun is the main evidence on the case. On the other hand, Mr. Grant argues that the seriousness of the offense makes it all the more important that his rights be respected. In the result, we do not find this factor to be of much assistance. To sum up, the police conduct was not egregious. The impact of the charter breach on the accused protected interest was significant, although not at the most serious end of the scale. Finally, the value of the evidence is considerable. These effects must be balanced in determining whether admitting the gun would put the administration of justice into disrepute. We agree with Appeal Justice Laskin that this is a close case. The balancing mandated by Section 24.2 is qualitative in nature and therefore not capable of mathematical precision. However, weighing all these concerns, in our opinion the courts below did not err in concluding that the admission of the gun into evidence would not, on balance, bring the administration of justice into disrepute. The significant impact of the breach on Mr. Grant's charter-protected rights weighs strongly in favor of excluding the gun, while the public interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits weighs strongly in favor of its admission. Unlike the situation in the Queen and Harrison, the police officers here were operating in circumstances of considerable legal uncertainty. In our view, this tips the balance in favor of admission suggesting that the repute of the justice system would not suffer from allowing the gun to be admitted into evidence against the appellant. Part C, the meaning of transfer in sections 84, 99, and 100 of the Criminal Code. Mr. Grant argues that his conviction of possession of a firearm for the purposes of weapons trafficking under section 101 of the Criminal Code should be quashed on the grounds that he did not transfer the firearm within the meaning of that section. 
In the Court of Appeal, Appeal Justice Laskin noted that the word transfer is defined in Section 84 to mean sell, provide, barter, give, lend, rent, send, transport, ship, distribute, or deliver. He observed that the dictionary definition of transport is to carry, convey, or remove from one place or person to another. He also noted that Sections 84 and 100 of the Code were enacted with reference to the Firearms Act, and he considered this wider context. Appeal Justice Laskin was not persuaded that there was any reason to depart from the plain meaning of the word. On this definition, Mr. Grant's admission that he was dropping off the gun somewhere up the road entailed moving the gun from one place to another and was therefore sufficient to establish all elements of the offense defined by Section 101. Mr. Grant submits that a contextual reading of Section 100 and the related provisions reveals that Parliament intended to reserve the stiffest penalties for transfers that amount to weapons trafficking, not the mere movement of a firearm from place to place. Since the trial judge did not find he was in possession of the gun for the purpose of transferring it to another, Mr. Grant argues that the Section 101 conviction cannot stand. We agree with Mr. Grant that Parliament did not intend Section 101 to address the simple movement of a firearm from one place to another. First, according to the associated meaning principle of statutory interpretation, when two or more words linked by and or or serve an analogous grammatical and logical function within a provision, they should be interpreted with a view to their common features. Once again, the definition of transfer is given in Section 84 as sell, provide, barter, give, lend, rent, sell, transport, ship, distribute, or deliver. Of these words, only transport can plausibly be said to include moving a thing from a place to a place without the thing actually changing hands. The common element is the notion of a transaction. This suggests a more restrictive meaning than indicated by the dictionary definition of transport. It should also be noted that Section 101A applies to the transfer of a firearm, whether or not for consideration. Even if transfer is equated with transport, the underlying word suggests that the import of the provision is to criminalize the transfer of firearms for purposes that implicate others. In other words, the inclusion of the phrase, whether or not for consideration, in Section 101A suggests that Parliament did not intend to criminalize simple movement of firearms by this provision but rather transport for purposes that implicate another person. Further, the criminalization of an offer to transfer a firearm under Section 101b suggests that a transfer is transactional in nature. We do not accept, as did Appeal Justice Laskin, the proposition that the more restrictive reading of Section 101 would destroy the cohesion between the Criminal Code provisions on firearms and the Firearms Act. While it is undoubtedly true that Parliament intended to place tight restrictions on the movement of firearms, there are other provisions in both regimes that deal specifically with transfers that fall short of trafficking. Moving a firearm in an unauthorized manner could result in a prosecution under Section 86.2 of the Criminal Code, which penalizes the transportation of a firearm in contravention of the regulations made pursuant to the Firearms Act. Moreover, the Firearms Act defines transfer differently from the Criminal Code, so their cohesion should not be overstated. Finally, Section 101 appears in the Code under the heading Trafficking Offenses. As the Court held in the Queen and Davis, per Chief Justice Lemaire, headings should be considered part of the legislation and should be read and relied on like any other contextual feature. Firearms trafficking offenses are extremely serious carrying substantial penalties. Indeed, since the amendments to the Code in 2008, a conviction under Section 101 now carries a mandatory minimum penitentiary sentence of three years for a first-time offender, up from one year when Mr. Grant was convicted. It should not be lightly assumed that Parliament intended to deem anyone moving a firearm from place to place without authorization to be a weapons trafficker, liable to at least three years' imprisonment on a first offense. In our view, a contextual reading of the applicable provision suggests the contrary. Mr. Grant's offense was serious and potentially extremely dangerous, but on the evidence he did not commit the crime of trafficking. We would therefore allow the appeal on count four. Part five, conclusion. We would allow the appeal on count four, the trafficking charge, and enter an acquittal. On all other counts, we would dismiss the appeal.
Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.